Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode number seven of the We Can Do This podcast. My name is Rylan Englehart. I am your host. Uh, this is Kiss the Ground's weekly podcast, uh, sharing conversations about how we can heal our earth and ourselves as we are one and the same. And I am also the uh, executive director and the co-founder of Kiss the Ground. And it really is uh, my great honor and privilege to have two amazing uh, stewards, experts of regenerative agriculture, biodynamic agriculture uh, with us today. And I'm also really thrilled that we're going to get to premiere uh, the biodynamic film called Biodynamic Agriculture Farming in Service to Life. Uh, and I just want to, well, I'll, I'll get to thanking all the partners and people that participated um, in that today uh, at the end of um, at the end of today's program. But first, I just wanted to say uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Thamaya, uh, and uh, welcome, uh, Rudy uh, Marchese. Uh, really, really honored to have you guys joining us today. Um, so we'll get a little bit more into your uh, background and your bios in a minute. Uh, but we really wanted to begin uh, today's podcast with just being um, inspired and moved by the beauty of nature. Uh, and we're hoping that that's what this uh, world premiere, this five minute video uh, about biodynamic agriculture and farming and service to life uh, will provide for us. So that'll set the context for our conversation and we'll jump in uh, after we've watched this film. So uh, thank you for everyone joining, tuning in. And uh, I'm going to share our screen and we can all watch this beautiful film together. There's so much that we don't know about the natural world. There's so much we can't even imagine. Nature works in ways that we can't even fathom. Biodynamics asks you to imagine things that seem impossible. Biodynamic farming is simply farming in service of life. It's not easily understood and it flies in the face of, of certainly the agriculture that I had exposed to me as a young farmer. There's a leap of faith to get into this kind of farming, but when you see the results of it, it's pretty obvious that things are working the way you want them to work. The moment a farm transitions into uh, biodynamic agriculture, the biodiversity improves, the quality of the food improves, and also the quality of life of the farmers. It starts with all of the good tenants of organic farming. We're not spraying anything that is toxic. No herbicides, pesticides, so on and so forth. Biodynamics, we go a step further in that you're leaving the land better than the way you found it. At the end of every season, our soil is more fertile than the year before. It's regenerative farming. We look at the whole farm as an organism. Human beings, plants, animals, cows, and sheep, birds, and owls, insects, frogs, the life in the soil, geese, and ducks. We see them as part of this entire farm ecosystem. Every species around us has a meaning and purpose. You're no longer at war with your environment, out there trying to kill bugs and weeds, and all of a sudden they're working for you. This is how we need to look at how we're going to produce our food, being part of life on the earth, not conquering life on earth. starts with soil. We're really farming the soil instead of farming crops. If you have really healthy soil, you can grow anything really well. The healthier the soil is, that translates into higher nutrition. There's a real straight line connection between the quality and the flavor and the aroma and the nutrition of foods grown in a biodynamic farm. 
There's so much pleasure in eating, but there's so much pleasure in feeling healthy. If we can all contribute to making this mainstream, then it will start to trickle down to communities that don't have access to amazing food, to healthy food. Water, carbon, nitrogen. The plant itself becomes the pump. Plants can pull carbon out of the air back into the soil. Every farm is doing its part to help with climate change in its own small way. We're a major part of what's happening now. And that's why I think this method of farming is the future. Every penny of biodynamic food that you buy, you are supporting the farmer who is connected to Earth, who is not polluting, who is a good custodian of this Earth and the humanity. So that's what we're doing here as a community. We're keeping the water, the soil, the air clean for our kids someday. Are you ready to make an investment in our planet so it can be here for the people we love? Because that's what it takes. Wow, gentlemen, such a beautiful job. Thank you for uh, contributing and being such beautiful voices for uh, that extraordinary film. Really, really appreciate you both. Uh, awesome. Well, I'm gonna jump in with just um, sharing a little bit about with our audience um, who, who you gentlemen are. Um, I'll start with uh, Dr. Tamaya. Uh, Dr. Tamaya is an expert uh, in organic and biodynamic agriculture, agroecology, uh, rural development, and traditional foods. Uh, he lives in Fairfield, Iowa. Um, Dr. Tim has worked with governments, the United Nations, agro-business corporations, NGOs, farmers associations, in systems of regenerative agriculture, uh, and has advised the National Organic uh, Program for Bhutan um, in their transition uh, to organic and carbon neutral, um, which is so extraordinary. I'm excited to ask a couple questions about that. It's really amazing. Um, and then uh, Rudy, uh, Rudy uh, Marchese uh, is the chairman of the board of Demeter, um, which is the organization that holds the biodynamic standard, uh, is a leader in biodynamic uh, viticulture, uh, and has been in the wine industry for over 40 years and Rudy supports and presides over uh, Montenori uh, Estate, carrying on family tradition of good land stewardship um, and was one of the beautiful voices in this film. So uh, thank you, gentlemen, again. Um, and before we get into the questions, I just want to share a little bit from the Kiss the Grounds perspective uh, why we wanted to create this film. Uh, you know, we are, we're an organization that really has been turned on and inspired by the potential of regenerative agriculture as a solution to so many of our problems as human beings on planet Earth. And uh, this idea, and actually speaking to the name of this podcast, we can do this. And uh, we really were looking at how we can point people in the direction of supporting regenerative agriculture. And when we looked around, we really saw that biodynamics was, um, and has been for a long time, a regenerative agriculture. And there was, it, it, there was an opportunity to uh, give it a new voice and bring it into uh, a more mainstream narrative uh, and really give it the, the uh, credit and extraordinary acknowledgement and the, of the integrity that it has. And so, um, yeah, we, it was really, really exciting to bring biodynamics into um, a new light or, you know, returning the acknowledgement that it, it really deserves. Um, and so again, we'll go into all the people that participated, um, but yeah, let's just, uh, jump in, um, and I'll start with you, Dr. Tim. Uh, how would you, how would you say, 
uh, in your own uh, words, how you are in service to life in, in, in the spirit, in the name of this podcast. How do you see and see yourself in service to life? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Ryland, for having me. It's a pleasure to be part of this wonderful um, endeavor uh, and share some of my thoughts. Um, I really have uh, um, great appreciation for Kiss the Ground team for doing such a wonderful work. Uh, how I'm uh, um, at the service of, uh, I would say, life, uh, throughout my profession, I've, uh, I've been working on uh, regenerative agriculture. Um, I, I've been, uh, I'm born in a farming family. We grow coffee uh, in our um, native place in India. And since my education has been in agriculture, but the transformation happened to me uh, after hearing to Peter Proctor, my teacher from New Zealand, who influenced me a lot on biodynamic agriculture. And that was the point in 1996, where I decided that this is the way to go. And this is the way uh, for freedom, because I've been seeing farmers uh, who are into organic agriculture or conventional farming system, they, there is no freedom, there is no empowerment, they are still under the shackles of big ag, they are still dependent on inputs, they, they, they cannot come out of this vicious cycle. So I thought that uh, I should um, serve the humanity through regenerative agriculture systems. So in 2001, me and my wife started our own consulting company in India called Natura Agro Consultants. We started advising a large number of projects um, in the Asian region and also the United Na uh, Nations. And then uh, the, I, I got an opportunity to serve uh, the government of Bhutan for six years to help them to transition the whole country into uh, what I call is the, uh, the true form of regenerative agriculture, wherein it's not just about the soil, but, all, but about uh, bringing social and cultural values into the developmental paradigm. And Bhutan, as you know, is very well known for the gross national happiness paradigm. So that was much easier for me uh, to integrate the regenerative agriculture practices. So, uh, so and, and I've got many examples where I help large organizations to transition. I feel uh, it's my purpose uh, to add value to the lives of the farming community who are the most disadvantaged all over the world. When any situation happens, whether it is a, a COVID situation or any economic breakdown, it's the farming community that is the most affected. So I feel um, having a true regenerative system which takes care of the social, cultural, economic aspects into consideration and serving them gives me a lot of pleasure. And I wish to be in the same field throughout my life. Mm. I, 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 I got goosebumps. I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's a really beautiful, beautiful answer. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and Rudy, I, yeah, I'd love to hear your answer as well, um, how you see yourself in service to life and why you've chosen uh, this life as your, your, your life. Well, you know, I've always been uh, growing things. And just had my first garden when I was seven years old. It's just something that always appealed to me. Um, and I got into the, the wine business um, early on. But... Um, as I alluded to in the film, you know, when you're a young grower, you go to the university and they tell you how to do things and you take that as the Bible. And it didn't take me long to figure out that I didn't like handling all those materials that you had to buy from someplace for a lot of money to kill off, you know, whatever it was that, that was um, giving your crop a hard time, be it weeds or fungi or whatever. And I became more and more interested in, in, in organic and, um, and then I did a, a short stint um, to put my daughters through college, really, working on importing wine and managing that. And I kept noticing that all these biodynamic wines were really, uh, there was something really special about them. They were vibrant. They were alive. They got your attention once you, you, you put them in your mouth. And it was something very different. So I started exploring that and was fortunate enough to find a course in biodynamics um, at small college in New York, Sunbridge College. And uh, when I got to Oregon 20 some odd years ago, I took over the operations at Montanor and it had been farmed um, 
conventionally with herbicides and chemical fungicides and the, the farm was suffering. And, um, you know, my main goal was to make really good wine, but as a human being, I, I didn't feel right about what we were doing to this farm. And I felt like the, the life force of the farm was really being suppressed. And I learned um, in the process of converting Montenor to organic and then biodynamic, just uh, the power of these practices in bringing health and vitality back to just this little corner of the earth that I, that I have stewardship over. And, um, and the more we do it, you know, I see the cumulative effects of, of just consciously trying to build the health and the life and the vitality into this one 200 some odd acre place. Uh, and it's, I feel like in a little way we're, we're, we're doing, we're doing our part for, for the earth, you know, we're sequestering carbon, we're uh, having plants putting out um, a lot of oxygen, we're not putting anything bad into the, into the, uh, the water tables, and we're providing really nice product for people. And um, that inspired me to get more and more involved in Demeter and, and encouraging other farmers to, to do the same thing. So that's about what I'm doing. Beautiful. Love it. Uh, I have a, I'll go back to Dr. Tim. Um, do you remember, is there, was there a vivid moment, like a specific kind of aha moment in your life where you really experienced or you kind of woke up to, wow, as a human being, I can be a beneficial presence or a beneficial participant in the living world? Was there like, do you, do you recall a moment that was like, um, touching or illuminating in, the, in, 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 that, in, that, in that context? Uh, yes, uh, the transformation happened to me uh, while I was doing my research during my master's degree. I was working on earthworms and uh, my first part of the research was uh, using earthworms as a bioindicator of uh, environmental health. So what I used to do was, um, after a land has been sprayed by the farmers, whether it is herbicides or pesticides, I used to collect the soil sample and take it into my lab and introduce the earthworms into those soil samples in different containers and wait for hours uh, to see what happens, uh, just to uh, see that how, biodyne, uh, how earthworms could be used as a bioindicators. And uh, after 20 minutes, uh, after I introduced these earthworms, these earthworms started wriggling. They started producing a slimy uh, substance on the top of the body, which turned yellow in color. And after two hours, the earthworms died. And this was like a uh, epiphany for me. Uh, well, wow. uh, it, was, it was a shock to me that even in those soils, when you ino in inoculate the earthworms, that the earthworms are so sensitive. And then I started using earthworms to teach school children by using salt, you know, table salt. I used to take some salt and put on the top of the earthworms and show them that the salt, which is um, so beneficial for us as a mineral, as we use every day, a little bit of salt, if you put it on the earthworms, it kills them in, in, in a couple of hours. So what to talk about this fertilizers and pesticides. I think from that was the moment I decided, because my graduation was in conventional agriculture. Uh, I changed my farming practices, which my parents were doing organic into conventional because I was a student of agriculture science. And they were doing all organic, everything fine. I told them that you belong to an old school of thought. You need to apply fertilizers and pesticides. And they heard me because I was sent to uh, uh, learn and gain the knowledge in agriculture. But during my master's, that was a total um, uh, you know, a transformation that happened to me. And I went back and I had to tell sorry to my parents that, guys, what you're doing was great. That was right. Please continue doing. And this is what I learned from my research. And since then, after my master's for my PhD, I worked on biodynamics because uh, the beauty uh, is about... Um, the, the, the appreciation of life as a whole, you know, as an integrity of life. And that, that these were some of the moments that uh, totally transformed my life. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. 
Uh, how about you, Rudy? Was there a, a moment that you feel like was just, um, as, as Dr. Tim said, was an epiphany just around uh, the interconnection of life and that you could be uh, and provide a beneficial uh, contribution to the, the overall web of life? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a grape grower, a winemaker, and so I see the world through the lens of grapes, really. Uh, and it's a really uh, wonderful crop to be growing because it's perennial. I'm working with the same vines that can live 50 years, you know, and, or more. And we work with the same vines year after year. So when we converted first to organic and then to biodynamic, you know, initially we were having um, issues with uneven vine growth and you know, getting getting more even ripening was difficult, and a lot of a lot of things along those lines. And as we started really diving into the biodynamics, we hit it hard the first few years because we knew we were doing the conversion. You know, intellectually, you think about what's happening in the soil, and you know, you can get your shovel and easier, and you can see, like Tim was talking about, worms healthier. But my world was grapevines, you know. And after about four years, all of a sudden, I saw a transformation in the way that the vines grew. And we're talking tens of hundreds of thousands of vines here. And all of a sudden, the whole vineyard, the shape of the vineyard started changing. And it became not a, a plot of land with individual vines planted on it, but it became a community of mm. grapevines where they all started becoming together and working together and it became more uniform in their growth patterns and the ripening patterns became more consistent and more uniform and timely. And that was very profound for me to see this, this dramatic change on such a, for me, a large scale. Um, and, and I was able to direct through a healthy activity, this 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 community of vines in a direction that would help our business and help our employees and you know help us to keep farming. So that that was kind of a big aha moment for me. Mm. Yeah, I could I can when you were describing it, I could visually see the kind of the totality of the land kind of as one sort of uh, being kind of shifting shifting and shaping and and experiencing it as 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 one one organism as they say um but yeah that's beautiful um awesome back to back to you dr tim uh at a at a at a practical level how how does biodynamic agriculture work and what are the guiding principles um that um are are kind of the the biodynamic principles of agriculture um, yeah, uh, one of the um, unique, I would say, the guiding principle of biodynamic is considering farm as an organism. You now, understanding the parts as systems by themselves and connecting these parts to the wholeness and doesn't stop over there. In organic agriculture, some of the best organic farms may stop over there, but connecting parts to the wholeness and wholeness to the self is where the biodynamic is different. It's, uh, uh, it's, about, it's about treating the farm as you want to treat yourself. How uh, we can be gentle, how we can be kind and compassionate. So these are some of the very basic principles of identifying farm as, a, uh, as an individual. It has its own identity and treating it in a way that is very appropriate to those conditions. In biodynamic agriculture, all the practices of organic farming are practiced, you know, whether it is composting or cover cropping or mulching or biological management, all these are there. But, but more important, we have a set of special preparations. These are um, almost like, uh, I would say, a catalyst which, which enhances the, the processes, the, the process of the nature. And biodynamic agriculture is, uh, I would say, it's, it's more about mimicking nature, how nature works. It's not just about the soil, but also take the lunar and the planetary aspects into consideration. Whether we believe it or not, we are under the constant influence of the cosmos, whether the sun or the moon or the planets. And the same thing we see in wild habitats, whether it is wild animals or, or weeds or wild plants. 
there is a rhythm, there's a creative intelligence in nature. So uh, aligning our intelligence with the farm's intelligence, with the creative intelligence of nature is what biodynamic agriculture is all about. And, and this results in food, which is not just proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. In fact, it's the process of producing food, which is a piece of intelligence of nature. You know? so, um, um, so all these aspects are integrated, are well knit under what you call as the biodynamic agriculture practices. And, uh, and more than that, it is an awakening process for the farmer. It is not just a set of practices that you do for growing crops. It is, uh, it is a, a, a inner transformation. You know? What we see today uh, on climate crisis and climate change, we cannot change the climate unless and until there is a change of inner climate. So biodynamic agriculture starts from there. The intention to create incremental improvements in all aspects of the farm, whether it's the soil or the seed or the biodiversity or nutrient density, all those aspects starts with a strong intention and then utilize Steiner's knowledge on farm as an organism. You know, the word organic agriculture was coined by Lord Northbourne from Oxford uh, University. He was influenced by Steiner's philosophy of considering farm as an organism. I think that is the unique thing because unless and until we consider farm in its totality and treat farm, treat land, treat environment, treat mother earth with gentleness and care, I don't think uh, we can call any system of farming as regenerative systems. You know? uh, so so that, that's what I wanted to share with the practices. We can go into the details probably later. Uh, one more follow-up question to that is, uh, you, you mentioned Steiner. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Waldorf kid, uh, Rudolf Steiner, the founder of Waldorf Education, also biodynamics. Uh, many people speak about him as a, a mystic, uh, even before he got into education and farming. Um, so, yeah, and, and in, even in the beginning of the video, uh, it, it acknowledges that biodynamics asks us to uh, almost believe or, or, or be uh, available to the supernatural. Um, what, are, what are some of the, what are some of the, the kind of um, the ways that biodynamic invites us uh, to consider the supernatural? Yeah, Steiner was a clairvoyant, he was a mystic, and also he was a scientist. He was highly influenced by the uh, Eastern philosophy. He has written a beautiful uh, book called The East and the Light of the West, and he has written two, uh, two uh, there are two um, uh, books on, a series of, on, on his lectures on Bhagavad Gita, and he talks a lot about the Eastern, uh, Eastern philosophy, which which uh, especially the Vedic philosophy, wherein um, you know, we need to go deeper into our own selves. You know, life is not created by substances. Life is created by non-material uh, entities. So he, he emphasizes on diving deep inside. One is objectively looking at the reality uh, through our sense organs. And he says that we need to have special uh, spiritual senses to go deep inside and work from that level of uh, creative intelligence or that level of feel, what we call as the bosons particle, which is very fundamental for creation, which brings in unity, which brings in awareness that farm is an extension of my own self. Everything, uh, we are connected with everything else, you know? So those basic tenets, help us to understand the subject at a much deeper level. And Steiner was extremely uh, instrumental in bringing those Eastern thoughts into the Western way of putting things so that you know, we could understand the philosophy and the practices together. You know, I don't know whether that answers your question, Alan. Yeah, it was wonderful. Rudy, anything you wanna to add to uh, kind of, biodynamic practices and or speaking to 
um, the, the mysticism um, and the invitation to um, kind of the mystery that biodynamics invites us into? Yeah, um, well, a lot of things cross my mind here. <clears throat> you know, when you talk about supernatural, I, I always think of that as that which we just don't understand. <laughs> still there, you know. Mm. But in in the biodynamic practices, as as we were talking about, you view the farm as one living organism, and you're working on that organism and bringing life and vitality to that organism. And I think in the um, in the conversion process from coming from a chemically farmed farm to a biodynamic farm and you know, everything in between, one of my observations was that chemical fertilizers, herbicides, things like that are, are disruptors in this connectivity. You know, in, an, in our world, everything is connected. And the more you farm this way, the more you observe uh, all of the things that happen when you're working to bring life to something, you realize there's a, there's a connectedness between everything really what's in the soil what's the plants what's in the environment you know as tim was saying you know the cosmic forces that are coming down it's all connected and when you have um, these disruptors in there you're breaking this connectivity and and when you start repairing that and allowing these uh, these levels of communication to be healed and to become more vital and more active through the use of biodynamic preps which are almost like signals, uh, signaling molecules or, or catalysts uh, to, to enhance the life, to, to activate it. When you start having this connectedness, um, there is an intelligence that emerges. It's a farm intelligence. I, I always talk about our, our grapevines are getting smarter every year. There's an intelligence in, in how, they, how they respond to their environment. And, you know, we see the vines, uh, now that we've been doing this for 15 years, we have much less incidence of things like botrytis and other molds that conventional farmers are battling in rainier years. Our vines just have developed a way to, to evolve, to, to respond to their environment. So they're now becoming more a part of their environment rather than just this, this sheltered entity that is, you know, that has to need some help to survive. And I think that's what biodynamic farming does is it, it brings intelligence to the farm and it brings this intelligence and a, an ability of, of adaptation to the plants that, that you are trying to grow there. Uh, to me, that's really powerful. You know, we, we even, we even use the preps and ways to kind of fine tune where, where we want, what we want our grapes to taste like, you know, we can do that. These are really powerful tools. Don't ask me how they work because I don't know. Um, it's <laughs> beyond my comprehension. You know, this is really complex stuff. I don't understand life. I don't understand, you know, what happens in nature. I just feel lucky enough that I've discovered this methodology that allows me to, to work with it and, and get positive outcomes. Mm. Beautiful. Love that. Thank you, Rudy. Um, all right. I'm going to ask a more kind of um, nuts and bolts uh, grounded question. Uh, for those that are interested in health and wellness and nutrition, um, how could you guys speak to, and Rudy, you can take this one to start. Uh, how, do we, how does biodynamic agriculture create healthier food? And what are some kind of facts or ways that people could think about this so that really illustrate biodynamics creating um, more nutritious food? Well, you know, we, we measure nutrition in certain ways that, um, that, that we have. It's pretty limited. Um, and then there's, there's other parts of nutrition that we don't, don't even have ways of measuring or talking about. I think one illustration of that is, um, is when you get bi biodynamic vegetables, the shelf life is phenomenal. I've talked to chefs, they go, gosh, when I get biodynamic produce, it, I, I forget about a head of something and I go back in the cooler a month later, it's still green and viable, whereas other vegetables be rotten, you have to throw them all out. It's about the life force in the, the plants. And I think it, that's, that's really a profound thing because what are we trying to do with nutrition? We're trying to bring life into, 
into our bodies, into our living entity. And if we're taking products that are very powerful, plants, you know, produce, they're very powerful in life force, that's feeding that, that nutritional need that we have. Uh, you know, if you look at nutrient density and things like that, there's not much measurable difference between organic and biodynamic. It's this other aspect of life force that we don't have a way to measure, we don't even talk about, that I think is the real critical uh, element in the nutrition of biodynamic produce. Beautiful. Dr. Tim, anything you want to add to that? Yeah. And you, uh, could, you, you could also speak yeah. to the, the, the function of how uh, plants receive nutrition um, from healthy soil and, and kind of describe that if, yeah. that, if that plays into your answer. Yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, thanks, Rylan. Uh, so when, uh, when, you, when you go back to the history of biodynamics, when it was started um, in, the, um, in the mid 30s, when it became popular, there were groups of people who were um, adopting biodynamic agriculture. And it was the women uh, and the doctors, these are the two groups which, which promoted biodynamics on a large scale in Europe because the women liked it because uh, the, as uh, Rudy was mentioning, the shelf life of the uh, vegetables, the food was higher. Uh, it was very aromatic. And, uh, and more than that, they f the doctors felt that uh, these are pretty healthier um, you know, for, 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 for human beings, you know, which can develop immunity. And which is also true even today. Uh, you, you take any wild produce, I think wild produce can be a comparison uh, because wild plants follow the rhythms of nature. Nobody plants the wild seeds, which unfortunately we call these wild plants as weeds. I don't want to call them as weeds. I call them as voluntary plants, uh, which to a large extent are edible. Uh, so these wild plants follow the rhythms of nature. They know when to germinate, when to flower and when to die. And when we eat wild plants, very rich in polyphenols, they're very rich in aroma, and, and you have a very different feeling uh, after consuming the wild plants. So in biodynamics, since we adopt uh, this planting calendar, we are transforming a crop to somewhat, to, to some extent, a wild plant, I would say, in a very uh, raw language. Uh, so, so it tastes like a wild plant. Our vegetables taste like wild plants. It has all those polyphenols. It is, it is nutrient dense. As Rudy was mentioned, there are so many things that we cannot measure, but we can see in the effect. The chefs are the best people to assess that. Um, that this very rich aroma and the taste and the shelf life. And also the, all the organoleptic qualities. The coffee, uh, the co I read by a large number of coffee estates. The biodynamically uh, grown coffee, they had a great cup tasting. The tea had a great cup tasting. Um, the, the, uh, the turmeric had the highest um, curcumin content. Uh, even I think in the Guinness Book of World Records, the highest sh uh, sugar content and sugar beet is from a biodynamic farm. So all those organic, all those uh, qualitative parameters improve in, um, in, in, biodynamic, uh, in, in biodynamic agriculture. And uh, um, it is how the food is produced, Ryland, at the end of the day. Whether you are adopting degenerative practices, which, are, uh, which kill every species on this earth, or are you adopting um, regenerative practices, which supports nature, builds those interrelationships? Because it's the food uh, which, which uh, leads to our human thoughts. And as there's a beautiful saying, as the food, so the mind, as the mind, so the thoughts, as the thoughts are actions. So the food has a huge role to play in all our activities in providing, not only in providing nutrition, but also in, in providing that nature's intelligence. Now, how do you transform that nature's intelligence into a scientific paradigm of measurement and replication is a, is a question of debate, you know? But otherwise, the effects that we see uh, as, as the quality nutrition, as quality food is tremendous. As Rudy was mentioning in wine, you can see in Europe, especially in Italy, the Biden-make wines are three times more expensive than the, uh, than the conventional wines. It's just because of the quality. The qualitative parameters 
are very high in, in, in biodynamic agriculture. And it is all because we are imitating the natural ecosystem through the practices of biodynamic agriculture. And that's why we get a very high quality produce. You know, uh, yeah, does that? That's, that yeah, that's, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, my, my, my next question is, and this is in the same vein, but, and Rudy, you can answer this one. Um, when we're eating biodynamics, we're voting with our dollars for, you know, spending a little bit more for higher quality produce, organic or biodynamic. What for the mothers listening and for the family, you know, what, what are the chemicals that we're saying no to? And, you know, as someone who I think you came into the world of agriculture using chemicals, um, and realize that that was not the way to go from your perspective. Um, so what, what are we saying no to and what are the effects of those negative chemicals on our bodies or on the earth? Well, they kind of fall into a, a couple of different categories. Um, herbicides for one, um, herbicides are things you spray on the ground to kill weeds. And those things don't go away, especially when they're using pre-emergent herbicides. They trickle down, they, they're washed down by the rain, they get into the, um, into the uh, aquifers, and they become part of, in a very, very small way, but cumulative way of our drinking water. And, um, and th things like Roundup, you know, that's, that's a very, very popular herbicide. And despite what Monsanto claims, it doesn't go away. Now we're finding traces of Roundup in the rainwater. So every time you, you buy a biodynamic product, you're saying no to applications of these things. And then of course, it doesn't take much imagination to, to think that if you have an insecticide, something that's designed to kill a living entity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. insect, what's it gonna do to the human being? Yeah, we have these, what they call LD50s. You're not gonna die at 50% or whatever. You know, I don't want any of it. So, you know, there's a, in, in biodynamic agriculture, we have to live to these standards that are, that are the same as organic where there's restricted chemicals. Um, what's different is that we take the whole additional layer of activity to build up the health and vitality of the vines through biodynamic preparations and, and composts. So I think uh, uh, when you're purchasing, when you're purchasing biodynamic products for your family, you know that you're giving them, your children and your family, a pure product that's not going to have uh, elements of something you don't want them consuming. And you're also contributing to the or the I say organism, the entity that is producing this for you. You're supporting the biodynamic farmers and keeping them going and all of their workers and all of the families that, that live with the workers on the biodynamic farms. You know, we all are, are working as a community to produce these products for people. So um, every dollar spent on, on organic biodynamic products is really pretty profound. And I, I just want to come back to something that uh, Dr. Tim said earlier, which was, you know, his aha moment was seeing the soil uh, that was contaminated with some farm chemicals and then the worms um, interacting with that soil and then getting this residue, the slime on them and dying. Um, and then it makes me think of, uh, you know, maybe, you know, we're, we're kind of these big organisms, but if we think about, um, you know, our, the, the organisms in our gut that make our gut function, our microbiome work, and we think about those little organisms are very similar to the organisms that are in the soil, and that oftentimes are being, you know, explicitly killed with farm chemicals. And then to see that those are actually going to be, when we're transferring that food into our bodies, into our guts, you know, that we're going to be, there is going to be a direct line to killing those organisms um, in our guts. So, um, yes. So thank you. Thank you for that um, question. It, it brought that kind of um, thought into my mind. Um, so my next, my next question for you, uh, Dr. Tim is uh, how is, you know, there's kind of this uh, new emerging conversation, which, or maybe it's not that new, but Kiss the Ground has been really excited about how, you know, we can sequester carbon into our soil. We can build carbon um, into our soils through photosynthesis. And I just would love to, yeah, hear your perspective on how biodynamic agriculture can be uh, supportive to um, 
helping reverse climate change? Yeah, um, thanks, Violet. I think biodynamic agriculture has, uh, as, as uh, would play, I would say, would play a major role in addressing the current climate crisis. Uh, you know, it follows all the tenets of uh, organic agriculture. It helps to sequester a large amount of carbon because the emphasis is on soil and activating the soil. But it goes beyond that. It's about um, creating an uh, entire ecology, um, uh, a farm ecology that can support such ventures. If you look into the current um, carbon uh, sequestration discussions, uh, there are companies um, which claim to sequester large amounts of carbon, which are which are monocultures. You know, either they're large monocultures of um, corn or soybean or any other crop. Uh, and uh, how, my question is, how how does such systems support? You know, monocultures do not support on a long run. So, so biodynamic agriculture supports biodiversity. That is very key. You know, you cannot have large-scale monocultures. You need to have biodiversity. And the emphasis is on creating locally appropriate systems because farm is an organism. It's about soil conservation is very important. The recent uh, uh, study by Food and Agriculture Organization says that, um, you know, we can increase, if we can maintain the top, a few inches of topsoil well, we can increase the food production by 58%. So, so the current food product, uh, the current population can be fed with just maintaining the soil, okay? And biodynamic agriculture, more than uh, carbon sequestration per se, it's about changing from within. It is about the, the intention that it creates to bring a change. Uh, not only in the farm, but also in the community, talking and uh, empowering people about these techniques. And the greatest contribution, I would say, um, is of Steiner, because all the techniques that are mentioned, the practices that are mentioned, they are open source. There is no intellectual property uh, on, on biodynamic uh, uh, agriculture knowledge or practices. So any farmer without being dependent on external resources, can adopt these practices and help in regenerating our ecology and sequester carbon and produce safe and nutritious food. So in that way, it helps uh, to a very large extent, you know? Mm. The, um, you spoke about biodiversity. Um, which is seeming to be a conversation that's coming up more and more, the importance of biodiversity. Um, can you speak to, yeah, the, the importance of biodiversity? You know, someone say, well, why do we need biodiverse plants on a farm? Or why do we need biodiverse plants in a forest or in a prairie? Um, yeah, so could you speak to that? And then Rudy as well. Yeah, uh, biodiversity is um, very integral to the uh, I would say the the integrity of life systems. Uh, nowhere you have monoculture systems. You take a forest, you take soil, or you take any living systems. They're all biodiverse, and it is the diversity that brings in all those inter in, inter interactions. Take for example the roots. You know the roots have this trading mechanism of sugars. They they give a certain set of root exudates or sugars and and, and develop a biodiverse microorganisms or the microbiome around the roots so that the different sources, different microorganisms help to provide the nutrition from different sources. Similarly, our gut microbiome, it's not one species. There are thousands of species of microorganisms which live in unity. I would say biodiversity is a sign of unity. Wherever there is biodiversity, there is unity, there is a communion of various factors, you know, and especially in a farming system like a, um, a forest ecosystem, biodiversity plays a very major role because the moment you have a biodiversity, it helps to, to create a resilient farming system. The pests and disease incidents can be reduced to a large extent because uh, certain plants help in nurturing the prey, uh, the, the predators and parasitoids and the beneficial insects. There are other plants which 
have wonderful nectar source that can attract the pollinators. So we need birds and um, insects and microorganisms and plants to create that ecosystem which mimics nature. So biodiversity is uh, bringing the farm eco ecosystem very close to nature. I, we, we cannot replicate nature, but we are bringing uh, um, uh, the farm ecosystem to, uh, to, to, the, to the closeness of nature. So, so in that way, there are large, uh, there are umpteen number of ecological services that biodiversity provides. The nutrition, uh, um, uh, the nutrition that different plants require from different soil profile, the, the way the plant interacts with the, the vagaries of uh, uh, the, the climate uncertainties. So once you have biodiversity, it is like not putting all the eggs in one basket. The farmer can create a, a, a very resilient farming system and not succumb to the risks and uncertainty of monoculture, in addition to the ecological services that biodiversity provides uh, for, 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 for humanity and also for the farmers. Beautiful, thank you. Rudy, anything you wanna add? I, I have another question for you if, if, if uh, you feel like uh, Dr. Tim has communicated everything there is to communicate on that or for now. I, I think he covered that really well. Uh, beautiful. So again, in, in the spirit of that, this podcast is all about the spirit of possibility and the spirit of that we can do this. Um, Rudy, so for us as a human civilization, um, I, I believe that we can heal and regenerate our planet. And I just would love to, for you to share how you think that we can do it. Well, I think for starters, we need to bring the scale of our farming back to a human scale. I, I think what is going to be one of the big keys is having back to family farms where individuals are investing their intellect and their activity and their hearts and souls into their farms and into the providing really great nutritional produce. And as Tim was alluding to, and one of Steiner's tenants was that if you don't have good nutrition, you don't have proper intelligence, you don't have proper deeds, you don't have proper thoughts. And mm -hmm. I think that getting agriculture back down to a human manageable scale where we have higher quality products is really going to improve our, our culture as human beings. And I think that's key to all this. So, you know, the, uh, the, the coming up of farmers markets and the growth of that and the growth of organic produce and products and the growth of biodynamic products is all moving in the right direction. We just need to ramp it up. Mm, thank you. Uh, Dr. Tim, how, how can we do this? How can we grow this? How can we make, how can we heal, heal through uh, managing our land in a, in, a, in, a, in a regenerative way? Very simple. It starts with me. It starts with the individual. As Gandhi said, be the change to see the change. The mm. question, what can I do at my personal level is very important. Uh, for instance, you may say that I don't have a piece of land. I live in an apartment. What can I do? Even over there, I've developed some simple uh, techniques for high-rise buildings in Taiwan. Uh, we can manage our kitchen waste to begin with. You can make a set of preparations by the waste that we create, the washings of the rice, the washings of the lentils, which can be used for watering. The, the waste can be composted within the house by very simple techniques. Okay, that's the first step. And if you have a little garden, I think we need to come out of this um, colonial colonization of our landscapes by lawns, by grass. I think this is the stupid and the dumbest. <laughs> Do we have large lawns? We need to transform these landscapes into edible landscapes. You know, can we transform these? trees on our walkways into edible landscapes. So these are some certain things that we can do around us. The second important thing is, is start talking to people. We need to, our discussion should not be the gossips or the politics. Let's talk about food. And uh, Rolf Steiner uh, mentions about uh, Bhagavad Gita in his, uh, Bhagavad Gita in his book, uh, Bhagavad Gita for the West, and over there, it very clearly mentions uh, the definition of the food. Uh, uh, it says that food, is, uh, food should provide long life, health, happiness, strength, and love. You know, today, the food doesn't provide any of these things. 
we are what we eat. Now, if we produce food through violent means, through means that destroy the ecology, mm. the product that we get is the violent stuff. So we need to totally, I would say, radically redesign the current um, degenerative food and agroecological systems so that we produce food with non-violent means. You know, Gandhi, G, Gandhi was to say, ahimsa, non-violent means of agriculture is, is, is a need of the art. And biodynamic agriculture helps that because it is about connecting myself to the soil, treating Mother Earth as I treat myself, you know. And the third point which I see is that try to influence the local farmers. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, part of uh, a local food hub over here in uh, Iowa. So we try to tell to the local farmers to grow organic or transition into, into biodynamic agriculture uh, so that the quality of the food that we receive is supreme, is nutrient dense, it is produced where, um, uh, by aligning with the laws of nature. I think th these are some of the things that each one of us can do and consumers can play a major role in motivating the biodynamic farmers, those farmers who are the custodians of posterity, who, who are the good stewards of environment. I think the consumers have got a major role and this can happen by either by buying local or by buying biodynamically grown produce. So that this ancient uh, tradition of regenerative agriculture to help the humanity and the environment can continue, can prolong. I think these are some of the steps that we can take immediately today. Mm. I'm, I'm on fire. I love it. Thank you, Dr. Tim. We're going to answer one question uh, and then we're going to uh, wrap it up with one more viewing of the, uh, of the film for those that came on a little bit late. Um, let's see. Um, we'll just do this one. Thank you for this thoughtful discussion. Uh, what were the scientific sources of con contamination by Kiss the Ground that increased 0.0% uh, soil organic matter soil worldwide would constitute carbon sink adequate absorb uh, atmospheric carbon? Uh, what are the guest views? Um, he's br they're bringing up a, uh, a statistic that I think maybe comes from, I'm not sure if it's Rodell. Um, so we'll, I'm not. I don't have the answer for that question in this moment. Uh, let's see, what are the differences? What are the differences between regenerative agriculture, permaculture? Um, uh, what are the implement, uh, what are ways we can implement regenerative practices? Uh, um, I think most of these got answered. Um, so yeah, we're gonna, uh, we're, 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 right on, we're right on the time that uh, we're meant to close. So I'm just gonna end uh, with a couple things. Uh, one, just, uh, yeah, a huge heartfelt thank you to both of you, um, extraordinary human beings uh, for the, yeah, for your service, your sacrifice, your um, commitment to Mother Earth and to uh, healing piece, small pieces of land such that can demonstrate that it's possible. And I just want to thank you for making your life about this. Um, so thank you both. Uh, and I just want to thank all the amazing partners uh, that made this video uh, happen. There was a, a lot of people who contributed. Uh, you know, I just want to shout out uh, Dr. Marcola, uh, Crofters Organic, White Leaf Provisions, uh, uh, Montetora Estates, uh, Bonterra, Frey Vineyard, uh, Truett uh, Hearst Winery, Brooks, uh, Brooks Wine, uh, Sauter Vineyards Biodynamic Association, Summerfield Waldorf School, uh, Nakusa, Cranberry, and Demeter. Uh, and also just want a huge shout out to the uh, director, editor, and uh, producer, Ben Cohen, and Tali Black-Brown, and Mallory Cunningham for, you know, for producing, co-producing, and her creative development on this. And there's lots more people that contributed, but I just want to uh, thank everyone uh, for your contribution for bringing this to the the world it's going to it's going to be have a public um, it's going to have a public release uh, on youtube uh, this friday uh, at 10 a.m so you know we'll share that with everybody who was a part so you can share that with your social channels 
Um, and then, you know, one final shout out for Kiss the Ground for those that are listening and uh, appreciate the work we're doing. Um, you know, the way that we're encouraging and asking people to support us is you can become a member and part of our community uh, for as low as $1 a month. Uh, and I think even in these times, these challenging times, uh, you know, we can, we can afford $1 a month. And actually that not only is um, $1 a month, but you actually get a free course uh, that how to, how to speak and become a, an amazing soil advocate in partnership with Commune. Uh, led by my co-founder, Finian Makepeace. Um, so that's all available to you and that'll be in the show notes uh, and it's all on our website as well. Um, and then just a, a reminder that we uh, do this podcast uh, once a week live on Wednesdays uh, next month uh, based on Mother's Day. The theme is honoring mothers and I'm gonna be interviewing uh, my stepmother who's also uh, a steward of a regenerative uh, organic farm in Vacaville, California. And, her journey of discovering uh, living in harmony with the earth. So that's coming next week. And uh, yeah, again, thank you, gentlemen. It's a, it's a true honor. And uh, we're gonna show the video one more time. And to all those that are listening and watching, uh, yeah, I, we, we, we hope that you have the experience of that we can do this as human beings. We can heal and regenerate ourselves and the earth as we are one and the same. So. On that note, we're gonna watch the film one more time. And uh, I appreciate you gentlemen. We will hopefully see each other soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. There's so much that we don't know about the natural world. There's so much we can't even imagine nature works in ways that we can't even fathom. Biodynamics asks you to imagine things that seem impossible. Biodynamic farming is simply farming in service of life. It's not easily understood and it flies in the face of, of certainly the agriculture that I had exposed to me as a young farmer. There's a leap of faith to get into this kind of farming, but when you see the results of it, it's pretty obvious that things are working the way you want them to work. The moment a farm transitions into uh, biodynamic agriculture, the biodiversity improves, the quality of the food improves, and also the quality of life of the farmers. It starts with all of the good tenants of organic farming. We're not spraying anything that is toxic. No herbicides, pesticides, so on and so forth. Biodynamics, we go a step further in that you're leaving the land better than the way you found it. At the end of every season, our soil is more fertile than the year before. It's regenerative farming. We look at the whole farm as an organism. Human beings, plants, animals, cows, and sheep, birds, and owls, insects, frogs, the life in the soil, geese, and ducks. We see them as part of this entire farm ecosystem. Every species around us has a meaning and purpose. You're no longer at war with your environment, out there trying to kill bugs and weeds, and all of a sudden they're working for you. This is how we need to look at how we're going to produce our food, being part of life on the earth, not conquering life on earth. starts with soil. We're really farming the soil instead of farming crops. If you have really healthy soil, you can grow anything really well. The healthier the soil is, that translates into higher nutrition. There's a real straight line connection between the quality and the flavor and the aroma and the nutrition of foods grown in a biodynamic farm. There's so much pleasure in eating, but there's so much pleasure in feeling healthy. we can all contribute to making this 
mainstream, then it will start to trickle down to communities that don't have access to amazing food, to healthy food. Water, carbon, nitrogen. The plant itself becomes the pump. Plants can pull carbon out of the air back into the soil. Every farm is doing its part to help with climate change in its own small way. We're a major part of what's happening now. And that's why I think this method of farming is the future. Every penny of biodynamic food that you buy, you are supporting the farmer who is connected to Earth, who is not polluting, who is a good custodian of this Earth and the humanity. So that's what we're doing here as a community. We're keeping the water, the soil, the air clean for our kids someday. Are you ready to make an investment in our planet so it can be here for the people we love? Because that's what it takes. Gentlemen, such a pleasure. Thank you for your lives. Thank you for your work. And I hope we connect again sometime soon. Thank you, too. Yeah, thank you very much, Raman. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful, much. wonderful day. Yeah, you same too. with you, too. Thank you.